This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Well, hey, everyone, it's Mark Bayer, and you are tuned to When Science Speaks. Thanks so much for being here. I am so glad that we have Jordan Birnbaum on the show today, and I want to get right to the questions, Jordan, because there are just so many interesting things to talk about with you. You've had such a fascinating I don't know if I, maybe career journey, career trek, uh, sometimes I say career trajectory, but you've done so many cool and diverse things in your life, and um, which I think lends itself to really have an, an instinct and a real sense for human behavior and understanding human behavior, which of course is your focus in your, you know, in your role, in your current role. And I wonder if you could start by talking a bit about understanding human behavior within organizations generally. You know, most of us are are working with other people. We're working within businesses, enterprise, government, nonprofits, whatever it is. And so we are part of this sort of system, um, but we probably don't think that much about, you know, really understanding how people operate in those environments. And I want to take the opportunity, as you're such an expert, to talk to you about that and and help us understand human behavior within organizations. There's so much to say. What a great question. I think that a good way to encapsulate it, though, in a way that's manageable is uh, through two questions. Uh, what's in it for me? And what's in it for us? And those two simple questions uh, capture the basic idea behind uh, two often discussed concepts of motivation, uh, which is what's in it for me, and engagement, which is what's in it for us. And um, motivation and engagement are actually two different things. Um, Motivation is uh, one realm of or or discipline of human behavior and um, generally speaking motivation is thought of in terms of two tracks Uh, there is intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation Uh, extrinsic motivation is what most of us are familiar with and what we usually think about and in the context of a workplace an extrinsic motivation uh, an extrinsic motivator is something like your salary or your title or your office Uh, or the possibility of a demotion, or the possibility of getting fired. But it's mainly the sort of carrots and sticks. Uh, But the important uh, sort of parallel among all of them is that these are things that exist outside of ourselves. So we have those extrinsic motivators. uh, And those are very powerful, but the most powerful is intrinsic motivation. Mm -hmm. Intrinsic motivation is I'm doing this because I want to. And not surprisingly, whenever we do anything because we want to, uh, and not because we're trying to get some reward or avoid some punishment because we genuinely want to, um, we try a lot harder. Uh, We're a lot more invested in that. And so um, intrinsic motivation is in many ways the thing that in the setting, in the context of work um, that we will always aspire to is can we Uh, create an environment in which we're we're able to infuse employees with intrinsic motivation. In other words, they're coming to work not because they have to, but because they want to. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that is sort of one half of the equation. And and of course, we could go deeper into the subject, but, you know, I'm always at risk of droning on and on to the point of uh, losing an audience. So I'll try to stay at a higher level. Uh, (laughs) And just to complete the thought, the other side of that is engagement, and that's the what's in it for us. And um, when we can foster that sense of connectedness and have people to start thinking about the group beyond just themselves, that we refer to as engagement. And that is a direct predictor of discretionary 
uh, effort. So obviously when people are trying harder, better things happen. And so motivation and engagement uh, is the short answer to those questions. Mm -hmm. um, and they are very dense and rich topics that we could talk about for hours. How do you think about trying to get that overlap? You know, it's such an interesting uh, concept, and I'm so grateful for the field of industrial and organizational psychology for um, making these concepts, I, I think, um, much more accessible in the sort of simplicity of explanation. But to answer your question, um, it's going to take two different strategies. And on the motivation side, and sort of getting you uh, into the headspace of I want to for me, as opposed to I want to for us, um, there are a number of different approaches. But um, certainly the favorite leadership theory that I ever studied and one that felt truest to me based on my experiences um, is specifically designed to uh, foster intrinsic motivation and it's mm -hmm. called self-determination theory. Uh, it comes to us from Edward DC and Richard Ryan, uh, two social scientists for whom I have tremendous admiration. Uh, and what they have been able to uncover through endless studies of organizations is that there are three things, if we can give that to our people, uh, three needs that if we can fulfill, they will start showing up to work because they want to and not because they have to. Mm -hmm. And those three needs are autonomy, mastery, and relatedness. And so I'll just give a brief explanation for what each one of those is. Please. Autonomy means I get to figure out how to accomplish my goals. It doesn't mean I get to do whatever I want. It simply means that once I understand the goals that I have uh, for my team, my organization, I get to figure out how to do them. Um, and by the way, that's not always possible to provide. You know, I think about um, labs and uh, it's really important to follow procedure and there's not a lot of room for autonomy. So mm -hmm. um, labs are a particular challenge in this regard, but I'll continue on with the with the theory, and then we could maybe talk about labs later. Um, so autonomy is the first component. Uh, the second is mastery. Um, so there is a fundamental human need for a sense of self-worth. And when we have an opportunity at work to demonstrate that our contributions are skillful, that they are contributing to a greater whole, that is uh, such a meaningful experience for us that it constitutes a, sort of a fundamental human need. And so when we say mastery, it's um, how can you as a leader not only provide autonomy, but then set up a situation in which every member of your team is having an opportunity to demonstrate what their contributions are and to be recognized for those contributions. Uh, and so that's the, the second piece. And then the third uh, is relatedness. And this is just talking about uh, the human need for connection. And so when we talk about relatedness, it might be among teammates, it might be with clients, it might be with the community, uh, it might be with uh, customers that you'll never meet, but that you understand are using the products that you develop. Um, it just has to do with there being some type of meaning in connection with other people through the work. And so if you can establish a working environment or a team dynamics in which people have um, autonomy to figure out how to achieve their goals, an opportunity to demonstrate their mastery on the reg, and uh, lastly, an environment in which the connections between human people are, are sort of front and center, um, then people are going to start coming to work because they want to. And so uh, it's a really worthwhile thing for leaders to take the time to think about how can I, for each person on my team, maximize these uh, experiences. Um, so that's what's going to get me their best work. And so then... I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that it's just so valuable for anyone who is leading teams or, you know, a PI in a lab or anything like that to think about and really focus on those three issues. And as you pointed out, the first one, autonomy, might not be a lever that's easily pulled, but um, maybe you compensate by, you know, increasing or turning to mix metaphors, turning the dials up even more on their relatedness um, and, uh, and the mastery. That and you get creative and you find ways, you create environments where people are able to exercise autonomy in some other realm. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe it has to do with scheduling. Maybe it has to do um, with hours, operations. Um, you have to get 
creative, but if you can find a way where you are creating opportunities for people to make choices for themselves, that's really good. Mm. Uh, and for us to feel like we're doing something we want to be doing, having that um, dialed up is definitely uh, worthwhile. And um, by the way, just let me also say this, that whenever I talk about this stuff in the context of a lab, you know, I always get a little gleeful because we all know that on, you know, the sort of status uh, ladder, hard scientists are always above social scientists. So we're always delighted whenever we have a chance to say something relevant and meaningful. Um, but <laughs> towards that end, that's, that's some serious insider nerd humor right there. <laughs> um, but towards that end, let me just finish the thought uh, so I can continue making a contribution uh, in my own way, uh, just around the topic of engagement. So um, there is a lot of overlap between um, engagement and the third component of uh, self-determination theory, relatedness, that if you go through and you look at what are the primary drivers of uh, engagement, a 10 out of the 12 most important ones uh, all have to do with relationships, either relationship with, with your boss or relationships with your colleagues. Mm -hmm. So literally one of the 12 most uh, powerful predictors of engagement are um, I have a best friend at work. Um, it, it talks about getting recognition. It talks about um, feeling supported in development, uh, feeling like your opinions matter. Mm -hmm. um, so the engagement side, when we're trying to get people to start caring about us, you know, intrinsic motivation is caring about me. Uh, engagement is, uh, want, I'm sorry, wanting for me as opposed to engagement wanting for us. Um, that has everything to do with the relationships, primarily with the leader, uh, secondarily with teammates. And so, and even that, of course, is ultimately affected by the leader. So um, usually when we're talking about engagement, if we're looking at uh, a place where we can really have uh, some meaningful impacts on what the teams experience, um, then focusing on the leader is, is the most direct way to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you brought up leadership because I would love for you to talk about what it means to be a leader as a scientist. I mean, we talked, you talked a bit about, you know, we're focused sort of as a lab right now as a unit of organization, but I'd like to expand that to society generally. We were in the middle. Well, I, I guess I can't say in the middle, we are experiencing a pandemic. I don't know when the other side is yeah, we're going to come out the other side. In the middle. Yeah. Um, but in any case, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing scientists, um, put in a more prominent role with respect to public policy, um, people, you know, generally in society reacting to recommendations that are based on science, whether it's to wear a mask, social distance, and so forth. And of course, once the vaccine is approved for distribution, that's going to be another, you know, major touch point between society at large and the scientific enterprise. And I would love for you to talk about and that requires some leadership and persuasion and, and um, you know, emotional intelligence and so forth. So I would love for you to, to talk about what it means to be a leader if you are a scientist. Yeah. Oh, it's such a wonderful question. Um, and it, it brings up something that I think is a, a fundamental underlying challenge and a particular pet peeve of mine. Um, and it's that, we have way too broad a definition of what it means to be a leader. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when we think about a leader, we're thinking about the person who is brilliant at setting strategy and setting the course for the organization. Um, we think about the person who knows what it takes, how to create an execution model that is sustainable and to sort of oversee it. And then also that we, uh, a person who knows how to attend to the needs of the team in order to foster the, the best possible performance uh, for them. And um, the, the sad reality is that there is no human being who is capable of doing all three of those things simultaneously, <laughs> um, and not necessarily due to a lack of talent, but merely to a lack of time. Mm -hmm. And so there is this sort of fundamental challenge in leadership. And um, in, in Western civilization in particular, I think that if we think about those three components that I just mentioned, strategy, execution, and engagement, um, we are very much uh, data-driven. We have a serious bias for the quantitative over the qualitative, uh, and especially in science, I am sure that there is um, an even bigger built-in bias for the quantitative over the qualitative. And that 
ultimately leads people to have more of an emphasis on focusing on strategy and execution, because that's where you can achieve the, the sort of quantitative metrics. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that actually the most important job of a leader by far is to get the most out of their teams. Um, and sadly, I think that that is the area in which leaders spend the least amount of their time uh, and where they are most needed. And so um, whether it's a scientist or really a leader in any field, um, I think that taking a step back to think about what are the specific steps that I can take uh, repeatedly to make sure that I am getting the most out of my team um, is a really valuable exercise and a really important thing um, to consider. And making sure that that is where much of the focus lies uh, in your day-to-day -day job. Um, and if that is not realistic given circumstances, then you need a partner. Uh, and you need someone who is, is going to be able to play that role while you are focused on other things. Mm -hmm. um, but th there is a tendency for uh, people to view leadership and view taking on uh, more and more responsibility as uh, virtuous and as advancement. Um, and unfortunately, I think it leads us to take on so much that we're not able to get to all of the different um, things that we could positively affect. So um, with that, what I would say is as a scientist, uh, not being a hard scientist myself, um, I don't know that I have the contextual understanding to give very specific recommendations on uh, best practices, but I would say that even if you take a step back and think about uh, autonomy, mastery, and relatedness, and start thinking about how you could be proactive in um, providing those needs, that will likely do more to raise the performance of your team than anything that you could think up from a strategy or execution perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, you know, it's a, it can be a difficult challenge. Of course, you've got an environment that's uh, fast paced, um, high pressure uh, and, and so forth. And it can be hard to take time and do that. But as you point out, um, if you don't do that, then you're not going to necessarily achieve the outcomes that you're looking for. I, you know, as you were talking, Jordan, I was thinking about the difference between output and outcome. Um, you know, out, I associate output with quantitative metrics and outcomes more with qualitative metrics. Um, and sometimes those are harder to measure um, or harder to see. Um, but the they can clearly be measured through surveys and questionnaires and, you know, length of tenure and organization is a good metric of, of how happy people are, or how they, how, how they feel on those three uh, categories, for example. Um, you know, you, you touched upon something that I'd like for you to expand on, which gets to this idea of data-driven, you know, information um, and presenting data as as you know isn't the end of the story uh many times in the hard sciences that uh, you know that sort of is seen as you know well here's the data that we have so far and then it demonstrates the following uh but there isn't necessarily a story or more information that's provided in context um that could maybe help you know push things forward in a particular direction or not. Maybe that's not the role at the time or whatever. But but again, getting back to the pandemic and trying to understand, like clearly now we're going to have a specific outcome that we want, which is people getting inoculated uh, once the vaccine has been proven to be safe and effective. And, you know, that, that uh that exercise or that effort, I should say, that initiative is not going to be successful if there is just this exclusive reliance on the data, you know, clinical trials showed it was safe and effective and so forth. Um, could you talk a little bit more about some of these qualitative aspects that are going to be necessary um, as the vaccine gets rolled out and as the public information campaign ramps up to encourage people to get vaccinated? Sure. It's such an important topic. And um, so what comes to mind as we speak about this is the field of behavioral economics, which is 
uh, basically founded on the principle that human beings are irrational. Um, and that is not meant to be in any way an insult, uh, rather an accurate representation of human behavior that can be in many ways explained by the limitations of the human brain. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we can look on this sort of built in irrationality as, as part of our programming. Uh, in fact, on a certain level, um, biases and heuristics, mental shortcuts, um, these are adaptive measures. And we, we've all sort of assumed a bias against the word bias. Uh, or uh, have experienced the bias against this whole concept because we usually conflate it with um, racial bias or age bias or gender bias. And those things, you know, are rightfully de deserving of our scorn. But um, what we fail to realize is that um, biases are themselves neither good or bad. They're, they're merely a shortcut. Mm -hmm. um, and I often like to, to share this story, which not surprisingly delights Canadians. Um, but for whatever reason in my life, every Canadian I have ever met is the most wonderful person, uh, <laughs> warm and generous and fun and kind. And um, it's just astonishing how many wonderful Canadians I've met. And so now when I meet someone and learn up front that they're from Canada, I immediately like them more than I possibly should. Um, I don't know anything about them. And yet I have this really positive affinity for them. And that's a bias. Uh, and so um, it just shows how biases can uh, affect us in all sorts of different ways. And it ultimately is there to account for the fact that our, our brains are not equipped to be able to process the amount of data that is available to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so once we can embrace a sort of rational embrace of irrationality, it helps to th see things a lot more clearly that um, when you are a quantitative thinker um, or a logic-based thinker, um, education should be sufficient to alter human behavior, um, but it isn't because we're human. And so it's hugely important that we think about the outcome that we're trying to achieve and then make sure that we are crafting the messages and the ways that we intend for people to hear them. And so I'll just give you one very quick example from the field of behavioral economics. One of, one of the more well-known principles comes from Daniel Kahneman. It's this concept of loss aversion, which talks about how human beings are twice as motivated to avoid losses as we are to secure gains. Um, and so with that in mind, certainly if you are framing messaging around the importance of a vaccine, do not focus on all that can be gained, focus on all that will be lost mm -hmm. if there isn't uh, a sufficient action taken. And then, you know, there's a, a long list of behavioral principles uh, and techniques uh, around framing and, um, leaning into the, the fact that when people are evaluating something, the point of comparison is ultimately what determines the evaluation. And so um, when you are putting something out there for human consumption, um, if you are not establishing the point of comparison or leaving it to chance, um, it's not going to get an equal evaluation. And so these are the kinds of things that we can sort of start to program into our communication strategies in understanding how the human condition operates. Mm -hmm. um, what are the tendencies that we see begin to emerge at a macro level um, from people relying on heuristics and biases and um, as Kahneman calls it, system one thinking. The, the fast, intuitive, easy kind of thinking that we all prefer to spend our time in. Um, how can we craft messages that are going to speak in that language, which exists outside the realm of logic? Yes, yes, so important to to remember. Um, and I like thank you for relating it to the to the vaccine rollout because um, clearly that's that's. Uh, and, and that's going to be an impact that affects, you know, that affects all of us. Um, we, I think we should be, we should be talking about um, not being able to go back to schools without the vaccine, not being able to go back to work without the vaccine. Um, and, and that's the, the point of focus that will have a, a much greater impact on the human condition. And, you know, as you're mentioning that, um, you know, it reminds me of the importance of the messenger. Who's telling us these things? Um, who is who is the spokesperson? Obviously, there are multiple people. Um, 
I mean, myriad people, number of people who are all over the place who could be effective messengers. Could you share your thoughts on the messenger for some of, so we sort of know what the communication um, color should, the texture of the communication that we need to impact human behavior, in this case, really encourage people to get vaccinated. Um, what are some of the profiles of messengers? Uh, because of course, our country is so, so diverse and there are you know so many different types of folks Folks, different types of communities all across the country. Um, what do you think about um, the the importance of messengers and the profiles of messengers? Gosh, that that would be a hard one for me to start to articulate. I think what might be um, a, a better way to answer that question would be to talk about the approaches that would be most likely to increase uh, persuasion mm -hmm. and, uh, influence. And, and for that, um, gosh, you're going to put me on the spot here, but there is a wonderful book, uh, entitled influence by Robert Cialdini, who is right. one of my personal heroes. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> and Cialdini talks about six areas, uh, that have outsized influence on people. And so let's see if we can get them all uh, here. And so the first is authority. Uh, and, you know, example A, Dr. Fauci. Uh, and right, there right. is something about having credibility that makes people uh, more likely to listen to mm -hmm. you. Um, now, it's not always about sort of based in the person. So another example is reciprocity. Uh, when people receive something of value from you, there is a sort of in, innate drive to reciprocate the kindness. Um, third is likability. When there's some kind of personal connection, when there's some kind of charisma, um, people are more influential. Uh, fourth is scarcity. Um, if there is a shortage of something, if you have to act now fast, that has a tremendous amount of influence on people. And that's why um, you, you know, so many sales have a cutoff date or limited right. supplies and the like. Um, then social proof is um, one of my favorites. So this just points to um, how the knowledge of what other people are doing uh, has a huge impact on us. So from the perspective of the vaccination, um, the message that the majority of your neighbors have been vaccinated um, will work far more powerfully than the message of get vaccinated, mm -hmm. um, which mm -hmm. will fall victim to something else called psychological reactance. Uh, you know, there's a lot to talk about here. Mm -hmm. with behavioral. <laughs> right. All right. So let's see, did we get them all? Um, authority, <laughs> reciprocity, liking, um, scarcity, social norms. Now I'm forgetting the sixth one. So uh, it'll come to me later yeah. tonight. I'll, I'll have a moment of hating myself. No, no, this is, this is great. This is really great. I want to ask you as we wrap up, Jordan, uh, you've mentioned so many important topics um, on leadership, and so forth. And uh, if listeners are interested in getting better at leadership and also, uh, you know, of course, understanding, uh, broadening their interpretation of the word leader, which is uh, what, what you pointed out as well as being really important, also sometimes reminded of lateral leadership, which is which just hard is so important and hard sometimes to exercise um with a peer for example oh that's uh, that's worthy of its own podcast right <laughs> right um but where should people go besides listening to uh to you and to this show uh if they want to get better at being a leader you know, so this is the point in the interview where it becomes so obvious that I need to write a book already because I'm <laughs> recommending other people's books. Right. I'll tell you about a book that really profoundly impacted me, and it's called The Five Dysfunctions of Teams by mm -hmm. Patrick uh, Leonid. Um, sorry, I'm just blanking on the name. That's now. okay. Five Dysfunctions of Teams. Five Dysfunctions of Teams. And um, it just, it talks about... Um, just how a team could go wrong and what are the steps that a leader um, can take to help bring about the healthiest dynamics within a team that will nurture uh, the best collaboration. And I remember uh, as I was reading it, Lencioni, Patrick Lencioni, mm -hmm. thank you, um, that as I was going through it, thinking like, this is probably the most practical, um, beneficial advice that I've ever seen in reading any business book. So um, that's a wonderful one to um, read up on. But just in terms of thinking, you know, here's what I'll tell you. I, I, I was 
Mark mentioned it earlier, that I've been in a lot of roles and had an unusual career, but one of the real benefits to um, doing it my way is that I led for about 20 years in a wide array of contexts, and then I studied leadership. Mm -hmm. And um, there are so many advantages to that, to helping me understand the subject as I start to um, think about it through an academic lens. But here's the one thing that I'll tell you, that once I learned about leadership from the scientific perspective, the thing that always stuck with me as the most important are needs. If you devote yourself to thinking about the needs of your team, individual level, person by person, what did they need to be at their best mm -hmm. and devote yourself to doing whatever you can to fulfill those needs or create an environment that fulfills those needs. Um, that is the best way to be a leader. Um, and uh, both from the perspective, perspective of motivation and engagement, uh, and also even from the human level, I think that um, one of the things that you'll find when you're in a position of leadership, when you think back over your career, the moments that stand out to you are always the ones where you treated somebody really well at a really important time that had a really big impact on them. And um, I think that the more that you as a leader focus on the needs of your team, the more moments you're going to have uh, as you reflect back on your career that make you really proud and feel really meaningful. And oh, by the way, it's also going to make your team perform better. So um, I would really encourage people beyond reading any of these amazing books um, to think about needs uh, and let that be your guide. And those will be the last words for today's episode. Just so wise Jordan, um, thoroughly enjoyed this. And I know our listeners did, a, did as well. Thank you for just sharing the very tip of the tip of the iceberg of your expertise with us in this episode. It was fascinating. It's a delight, Mark. Thank you so much. I am such a fan of yours and the show, and it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. And listeners, thanks so much for spending time with us on this episode of When Science Speaks. And I hope you'll be back next time for the next episode of When Science Speaks. This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields. From academia, to industry, to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. <laughs>